Network Automation Nerds Podcast. Hello and welcome to Network Automation Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cho. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, you'll notice that I have my Cisco DevNet swag on, my little beanie, my uh, DevNet sweater. And this is because today on the show, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome my good friend, Stuart Clark, Senior Technical Leader and Developer Advocate at Cisco. And today we'll be discussing some of his personal path as well as community building and his experience at DevNet. And most importantly, it's how DevNet could help you, uh, whether you're a developer or network engineer, to get started. So hello, Stu. Welcome to the show. How are hey, you doing? Eric. I'm good. Thank you, buddy. And you are looking absolutely awesome rocking that DevNet swag there. I <laughs> love <laughs> it. I love it. Yeah, thanks, man. Like, if, if people were looking at this um, from just like a viewership, they'll be wondering who exactly is working for for hey, devnet because i got you, all the swag you, and you got it all man yeah you got all the all the clay to stuff i think you yeah. probably have as much swag as what i do <laughs> but but <laughs> i'll i'll say this though i don't have as cool of a beer when with this i would never have that beer in my whole lifetime so you know um, there you have it you win flattery will get you everywhere thank you buddy <laughs> <laughs> no you 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 you've won that and um you know you look great and of course you know people could find you on uh, uh big evo beer on twitter yeah. as well as other and we'll put all the all the contact information in the show notes but just yeah. so that people would know the beer is like kind of stores yeah. uh personality is part of who he is and uh and you know for people who follow you they probably know the story right but um, but you know, let, let's just get, get right into sure. it. So Stuart, can you just tell the, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, sure. how you, what your background and, uh, and let's get, get going that way. Yeah. Thanks. Eric. I, I love to. So, yeah, I mean, you know, if you haven't seen me on Twitter before or seen, you know, seen some sort of like past interviews from me, I wasn't always a, a developer advocate. I, you know, before that I was a network engineer, but even before that, I was actually a hairdresser. I um I had a career change. I left school at um uh, sixteen and started an apprenticeship in hairdressing, and I, I did that for 15, 15 years, fifteen sixteen years, and then decided I wanted to get involved in 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 networking. And so you know, studied hard, put myself through the, the CCNA, um, passed you know passed the exam, and then started banging on doors, approaching people, um, companies, anybody, anybody that would talk to me anything to help me get into the industry. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. You know, people will ask, you know, what, what should I get first, the job or the, you know, certification? And, and you know, there isn't really a great, there isn't all one answer. You know, certification sometimes can come first. Sometimes experience can come first. It really depends what the company is looking for and where, where you're coming from. I didn't, because I didn't come from a technical background, for me, the certification was the thing to prove that I, 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 I could, you know, I could, I knew stuff and I could do stuff. So for me, that was the, the way forward. Um, I joined Cisco with just under four years experience, which was, you know, mind blowing, you know, when you think about it, that I always aspired that I wanted to work at Cisco. You know, I, was, I started out in a service provider environment, um, different levels of, of, of knock um, to, to run this kind of third, um, third line um, te you know, technical support. Um, and I thought, you know, one day I'd like to work at Cisco, but I kind of thought, well, you know, I'm going to need a lot more experience to get there. And, and the opportunity just came out of the blue, not even when I was even looking for it. I got approached uh, by, by um, a recruiter to, you know, do a three month contract with Cisco. And right. I took it. It was a big, big jump, really big jump. You know, uh, we got a, 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 well, it wasn't so much a newborn at the time, our son was three at the time so it took a big jump coming out of a full-time job into a contract job and, you know start at cisco and um, working on you know cisco's big networks and when we're talking big you know we're talking you know upwards of 30 40 sites you know millions of customers millions of users and this is when sort of network automation really started to take a uh, part in, in in my in my career always honest when i say this is that you know, for a number of years, I just kind of, you know, people talked about automation. I, I just kind of <laughs> I thought it was a fad. 
you know, I thought it, I thought it was a fad. I really did. You know, I right. thought it was kind of like, I kind of, um, everybody was talking about it and I was just sort of, I was just this huge CLI sort of command line. And I was, you know, always have multiple like, you know, windows open, as I say, different devices you know with the multiple monitors and it was just kind of like a running joke how i've got these things i was able to hop across you know different you know, things and stuff when you start working at that kind of multiple devices um and there's a lot of it and you're doing big global changes and you have to make those changes at a, at a pace doing that via the command line i started to make mistakes right it happens you know human error really does come into it as much as you have that attention to detail you're looking at one device and you know whatever you name your device you know and some people name them after you know characters and you know of the <laughs> hobbit or something some have got rack numbers and location numbers and uh we had um we used to use um uh airport symbols yes so, yes you know, airport you know so in paris is cdg and right you know, right we used to use all of those things because that's where all of our, you know, my data center. It, at some point, you're going to copy and paste something into the wrong device. Right, right. It's going to happen. I mean, I right. was really fortunate in that, you know, outages wise wasn't really a great big deal, but each site's running on its own private IP range. And then one time I just copied some ACLs in, which were, were connecting one VLAN to another, but those prefixes didn't exist within that data center. So nothing oh, no. was ever, everything's going to, this is going to happen. Right. You know, it's just going from one VLAN to another and that prefix doesn't exist. That private range didn't exist. I was really looking, but I had to roll this back. Yeah. So I, I started looking at automation and, you know, I was working with a great bunch of, a great team, really, really great team who had a lot of experience in automation. And I'd spent a lot of time with our SRE team as well, learning how they did things. And so they really took me under the wing and showed me a lot of, you know, you know, the, the power of automation. And again, right. you've got to say, say that in the right, you've got to say that kind of like, um, you know, like Darth Vader saying it. You know? <laughs> I wish I had that sound mod yeah, so we could do like, it, yeah. I am your automation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I started doing this and, I, and you know, working with these teams, it, it really showed me, you know, that this was such a much better way to work, especially at scale. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because I was starting to go through some learning and I came across DevNet. Yeah. But what's funny is I came across DevNet externally. I didn't find it internally. I found oh, it externally. interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So even though this was so, uh, so there was a couple of interesting bits that, that mm. you, you, you came up with, right? So, um, so first of all, it was, you know, you came up through the certification route and, mm -hmm. and I did as well. So it was, you know, it's so, you know, we, we kind of bridge over to the developer path as well. But so we could compare the two. And one thing that I would say is better for network engineer in a way is that um, certification gives you like a concrete path. Mm -hmm. And when you. Yeah. As opposed to developer, developers kind of, especially in the open source world, you, you're being mm -hmm. pulled in 10,000 different directions. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what is Git? What should I learn? Python, Perl? Should mm -hmm. I learn Go? Yeah. Everything's hot. But certification kind of gives you that path of yes. you should go A, yeah. B, and C, and then you'll get to D and so on. So what's your yeah. thought on that? Well, th and that's a great one. A really, really great question. I, and that is one of the reasons that we brought out the definite certification. Right. Um, you know, that is, that was always, you know, when people ask me what, you know, why was the DevNet certification come about? How, how was that born? It's, you know, like you said, as a, as a network engineer, you know, from a, from a Cisco partner perspective or a company perspective, as a right. network engineer, you know, you'd see it on the, uh, you know, on the, on you know, a recruiter would ask you or be on the site, have you got a valid CCNA or have you got a valid vendor cert, you know, CCNP? And you could see the kind of level that people were at. It was a good knowledge base to say, you know, I've got this certification. So my level of knowledge is at this, this level, CCNA, right. CCNP, you know, CCIE, CCDA, or you know, DE, sorry. Um, you have this uh, level of thing. When it came to code, like you were saying for developers, you know, even back in the early days, when I was working with DevOps team and uh, um, SRE team. They might have taken some Linux certifications back in the day. Yeah. They might have done this. But after, right. after a while, it became, 
learning on the job, reading documentation, you know, learning things brute force, you know, and being able to 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 to, to update their skills that way with in projects that they're involved in. But when it comes to like network automation or network engineer, network automation, so let's call that that DevOps is what we're yeah. calling it today. Sure. When you talk about that, how do you know if someone has a network, as someone who has a solid foundation in network engineering, how do you know that they have, you know, some strong Python skills, source control, CICD, they've got some experience with these tools? What, right. How do you measure that? Right. And for me, this was where DevNet certification really played a huge part in the marketplace because it, it kind of filled that gap. The only way that I, I really saw that happening in the past was, and, you know, we did this on the other teams that I was on was, we would be looking for, a, say, a network engineer with automation experience, and we wanted somebody at CCNP level. So we were right. going to be looking for somebody who perhaps had that CCNP um, right. certification or the equivalency of this. And then for the coding part, we would ha usually have to bring them in and have them sit down and do some coding and show what what they knew, right? You know what they knew. So they'd get a coding test and they'd sit for you know thirty minutes and they'd get you know, some Python code and they'd be using some APIs or they'd be using some Python libraries and they'd be asked to, to do this or fix something. And that was the way to do it. For me, this is, again, this is where the DevNet certification really plugged that gap because it, you were able to look at somebody who had a DevNet certification to say, well, to have passed this certification at this level, they had to know GitHub. They had to have known this X amount of knowledge on Python, this amount of knowledge in, with, with Ansible, you know, this amount of knowledge with you know, APIs on DNA Center, WebEx, um, uh, you know, Meraki, that kind of thing. They had to know that. So I think it was a really good way for the industry to start recognizing that new level of, you know, network eng who who is who has you know, developed a skill set as well. Yeah. So that's that's very important aspect of DevNet, which is it's it's kind of a problem in the industry in general, right? Like, how do you measure people's capability, and how do you uh, kind of fit that set of skill sets into the the job role that you're trying to fill. So you know, DevNet actually came up with this certification uh, mm -hmm. not long ago, but it's becoming pretty popular, I would say. And this provides a alternative path for network engineers who may have reached you know the NA level, the NP level, but now they're looking into expand. But yeah. you know, DevNet it's not it's not just about certification, right? Like DevNet is this whole ecosystem. So why don't you tell us what, you know, just, I don't think, I, I don't think we have another like a day or two hours to discuss mm. all of it, but just give us an overview of the kind of tools they provide, the, how big is the team and, um, you know, what, what consists of the tools that people could leverage? Yeah. So it's, um, you know, the, the team within Cisco, we're still a, we're quite a small team within Cisco. And I think this is some, Something that surprises a lot of people when they yeah. say, you know, wow, how many Surprise people are on the sure. team? Yeah, and you say, well, you know, this amount of people are like, wow, that's a lot of stuff that you're producing, you know, for you know, for, for, for such a small team. But when you look at our documentation, because we work so closely with all the, you know, the different business units, and I like to refer to that as interlock. So I have an interlock with, you know, a different platform teams. So I work with mostly the service provider team or, or within MIG, and I also work with SD1. Right. I've got a tremendous relationship with the technical marketing engineers, the PMs, the engineers, the people who are creating the APIs. I've got great relationships with that, you know, the directors, and I've got some, you know, outstanding relationships with some VPs as well, you know, for the for the for all of the content that we have on DevNet. And that's how we build that content. We work with the we work with the teams to provide that content. Um you know, on DevNet, the documentation, for example, like, you know, API documentation, best practices, use cases um, of how to even how to get, you know, how to get started. We like that journey of, you know, that first like hello world, you know, because that's really important. You know, I, I get making that barrier into this as seamless and easy as possible for somebody who hasn't used this API. Get that, get them started and you know, get someone able to make an API call within 20 seconds. You know, through our documentation with the DevNet sandbox, for example, yeah. provide all of that information. And so, when you look at all of our documentation, to give you this figure, and sometimes it really kind of blows my mind, is that our documentation we have over 18, um, 1800 people are creating this documentation. And this is, you know, internally with Cisco. So, when you look at 
like because this is all generative is we treat all of our documentation as docs of docs as code when you look at the count of how many people are contributing into this it's over 1800 people are contributing into this documentation to be wow. able to to do this and this is again you know people from tmes and pms and engineering teams from different business units organizations engineering teams at cisco being able to deliver this and essentially we're helping them curate this documentation to meet that to meet the audience to meet the developer who's coming to cisco to learn about the apis and this is how we you know build the sandboxes how we build the content we go on this journey with them and we look at the different uh, personas and the different type of people who are going to be using this as you know we, we you know who want to start consuming all of these things from different experience levels as well so that's something that we really really look hard into is who is using this what are they looking for you know what are they looking to solve and then keeping it current which is <laughs> a huge job within itself is making <laughs> sure because you know nobody likes stale documentation yeah you know, nobody likes stale documentation but yeah that's you know we're all about creating that de developer journey no matter what the background is because it's not just a network engineer who might be consuming an api there's going to be different teams you know devops engineers software engineers sre teams might be consuming apis and they're integrating it into their systems and they're using it so we have to think about that entire journey that they're going to go on yeah i i think you should speak for yourself i for one love writing like documentation and like just maintain tasks like sit around and you know <laughs> no 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 you're right right so it's it's kind of an issue and even even in the um you know cisco before devnet days i think it's always an issue not always an issue but it's kind of a point of content for people because cisco does so much acquisitions mm -hmm. and um so integration becomes a big issue and integration documentation seems to be always at the end of that tail it's you know after you integrate all the teams the technology you ship out the product and they go oh you know what somebody should have documented all of these so mm -hmm. people could actually use them but devnet as you know if you're uh, listening to the podcast we're obviously you know including the show notes but if you're watching a youtube video what we have on the screen is uh, developer.cisco.com and devnet is this one central location that includes all of these resources as mm -hmm. you know Stu had mentioned right and you know whether you're um a, a, you know someone who doesn't have a coding background they would provide hey start now or there's a different learning tracks if you're interested in enterprise in data center mm -hmm. i mean you could tell i've been on the site a whole bunch right <laughs> yeah, like, so, yeah. so i know everything <laughs> wherever things are um, the sandbox, which is, you know, clearly my favorite place to go to. Usually I, I bookmarked it and I go straight there. And there's also code exchange and ecosystem exchange. So um, I, I like the fact and, you know, you, Stu, you could you could tell me if I'm in the majority or in the minority. I like the fact that this is this one stop place where um, I could just go and whether it's NSO, whether it's the Yang model mm -hmm. or how does everything tie together? So. That's obviously my my favorite part, but you know, why don't you tell us what what your favorite bit is on the Cisco, you know, developer.cisco.com? Yeah, I think you know, for, for me, I think the sandbox is one of my favorite pieces as well. Uh, sandbox and sandbox and code exchange are two of my two of my favorite things. Uh, the sandbox really resonates with me because you know, back in the day, like so many people, you know, buying you know routers off eBay or you know from waste disposal places where you know they were getting rid of them um, <laughs> and, and and you know building a building a, a lab you know in, in in your house and you know plugging it all together was was really really great but as we've kind of evolved and we're now talking about sdn controllers and you mentioned nso there it's you know very unlikely that you want to be practicing your if you're learning and you're, you know for for experience um, it's very unlikely sometimes that you know your company might have a spare NSO environment just kicking around for you to play with. Um, you know you're not likely to purchase one, uh, you know, or something like that. And you're you're certainly not going to be doing it on you know getting your experience. You know if you've never touched this before in a, in a production environment. You know, so the sandbox you know allows you just to to jump in and start playing with all of Cisco's products for free. Um, right. You know. 
all you need is just a device to connect these two, you know, and it doesn't have to be the latest and greatest, you know, uh, laptop or PC. You can just jump straight in and connect to, connect to it. And then, hey, presto, you're working with, you know, Cisco devices and you've got all of the devices for your for your area now, whether you're interested in data center, collaboration, Meraki, you know, service provider, enterprise automation, it's all there for you just to hop straight into and, and start playing with. And it doesn't matter if you break stuff, it doesn't matter if you screw up because it's just a, it's just a sandbox. You know, you, just, <laughs> you restart it, you know. Right. So, you know, no longer do you have to do what I do, you know, buy a 48U rack and then power all these routers up in, in your living room to get that experience. You know, it's just connect into the sandbox and start, you know, testing your testing your code. And we provide that the learning journey in there. So, you know, there is an accompaniment in there with the learning labs as well. So if, if you've never used them before, you want to get more experience, understand the workflow, some more about the APIs, you can follow the, the learning lab, or you right. can just, just, you know, like I said, just jump straight into the sandbox and start playing around with it, experimenting yeah. around, you know, you know, trying out your code, and trying out Python, trying out Ansible, trying out Go, you know, with the APIs and start having a go and looking around. And we even get people, you know, customers who are going and then they're looking at something because they might just want to, you know, evaluate how something's working. They might want to look at, say, take XD, SD1, for example, say that they're running a version, I don't know, 20.3, for example, and DevNet Sandbox is running 20.4. They can hop into the sandbox and say, hey, what's changed? I can take a look at the API documentation. I can I can have a look at this before, you know, I, I might be I'll, I'll be able to see what changes are going to happen in my environment. You know, they yeah. might want to get that hands on or they might want to test their workflows to make sure that, you know, their code isn't going to break when they when they change versions. So they might want to just, you know, give it a try in, in that sense. So it's um there's a lot of really, really great content in that. I'm going to be, bi <laughs> I'm going to be biased saying this because this is my idea. But I you know having all of this content and this is free content yeah is to me it was it was one of the reasons you know when i started looking at that at first was like there's all of this content and it's free and i'm like this is just great i can just keep going and going and going <laughs> yeah, yeah you know it's like no a kid in the um... kid in the candy store exactly exactly right so um, so of course, you know, Stu, you you came up with a lot of the Cisco SD WAN uh, <laughs> programmability stuff, and you know, just use that as an example, right? So mm -hmm. if I click on the learning labs, it's actually four modules, eleven eleven mm -hmm. learning labs, five hours of quality stuff yeah. that you could just yeah. go into. Uh, like mm -hmm. if you just want plain vanilla SD WAN, or if yep. you want SD WAN with Ansible or Ansible pipeline or mm -hmm. integration with other DevOps tools like CI/CD yeah. and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. for the sandbox also, you know, there's always, um, there's two types as, you know, we see here on the screen. One is the always on where it's just, you know, devices that's, oh, like I said, always on. You don't need authentication, you don't need authentication, you don't need VPN. And there's also the res reservation labs where, you know, you build a bunch of them where it's, you know, you have to, because there's so many devices involved and certain topology that you have to pack that mm -hmm. you have to make a reservation but so far, I don't think I have any problem reserving labs um, in the time slot that's available for me. Yeah. So kudos to the team at, yeah. um, you know, DevNet for doing that. Yeah. And we do get that, you know, especially when we launch, like, for example, when we launched CML, right? Um, you know, we had CML on there and, um, you know, people had to wait a, a day to get, uh, you know, to get access, you know, in, in, into CML and it is typical that when we when we launch something it is going to be really busy you know right. we do get peak times especially as well when we have events on like DevNet Create we have DevNet oh we have uh, sorry Cisco Live you know we've got a lot of traffic going going it going going into the sandbox and the sandbox engineering team I mean they do a fantastic job I mean all of that you know we have close to probably 85 different sandboxes as well now and then maintaining this and keeping it up and running I was talking then about you know the um running automation at scale and having this big network this is nothing what i worked on was nothing in comparison to what they <laughs> you know and they're managing all of this and you know so that team really really pulls out all of the stops you know and if anything you know sometimes you know especially with the always on some always on sandbox it might go down for a period of time someone makes a change and it you know takes a sandbox out you know they're super quick jumping in there to be able to spin it back up again and, and get it up and running again so it's yeah, i mean 
huge thanks to our um, our sandbox engineering team. They do an amazing job. Hey, you know, DevOps at in at works, right? Like, so you could mm -hmm. just you know kind of do your pipeline, and then you know yeah. it's rebooted and so on. Yeah. Now I'm mm -hmm. actually starting to see a lot of dependency, right? So I'll hear mm -hmm. some people hearing say, "Oh, you know, I have to stop my uh, studying for a little bit because this weekend the the DevNet sandbox, you mm -hmm. know, particular sandbox is down and all that." So it's really, uh, you know, it came kind of came a long way when people start to depend, like make dependencies mm -hmm. of their project. Yeah. I know, you know, for the classes I've created for, you know. Uh, LinkedIn learning that I've actually give out worksheets on people and say, you know, if you don't have a home lab, like your CML lab, like we talked about, then a San, you know, Cisco DevNet Sandbox is a great place. So uh, to, to get started, to get your feet wet. So I am, you know, putting my putting money where my mouth is to actually depending on this, the success of the products I offer actually depends mm -hmm. on on uh, DevNet. So, yeah. so that's great, you know, and um, yeah. thank you for providing all the SDN. I know that, how long did it take you to come up with those SDN labs? Because everybody start asking for it and you, you're just like, okay, I'm just going to build it and I'm going to learn enough to build it. And how long did it take? Yeah, so uh, like I said, we work in conjunction with the, with the, uh, with, you know, with the SD1 teams sure. as well. So, sure. you know, they give us, they provide a great deal of, of help to be able to do that. Um, and they help us as well with um you know certain developments we we kind of outline what we want to do you know we we know from building and, and you know learning labs over the period when you look at like the 200 250 plus learning labs that we've built that we know the we know the how to build it at what pace we need to build it you know right. how to do the introduction and these things so writing the introductions and those those, those you know those pieces now becomes quite once you've done it a couple of times, it becomes quite easy to do. You know, mm. you start talking about the how how to get the introduction, how to do the basic things like authentication. Right. Once it starts to get into the you know the more sort of complex workflows, you know, you're picking up a product from you know brand new from scratch. So often, you know, you're using things like Postman as a as a really great starting point to start making API calls and to be able to turn in that around and then working with the BU and working through the, you know, the examples, what they consider best practice. Sometimes, you know, they have use cases, which we can just convert into, into learning labs and put them into that right formatting, you know, to make it more about a learning journey. And it, it, all we need to do is put documentation and the right wording, explaining how this API works, explaining how the authentication works in SD1's case explaining how the templates work, you know, explaining how the API calls work in this, in this particular workflow. So it becomes, you know, writing my, I remember when I wrote my first learning lab, it was, you know, looking at it now, thinking back, thinking, uh, you know, maybe I should have covered this in kind of more <laughs> detail, you know, doing that. It just takes you a little bit of experience. You, I mean, you've created some awesome content over the years. It's getting yourself into that, into that mindset and 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 not assuming anything as well just because you know it doesn't mean somebody else does right and so sometimes you can think well should i be writing that because that's you know kind of I, but no you have to write it down if somebody already knows it great they'll skip over that bit they'll go to the next bit but for somebody else this might be completely completely brand new right and so within that level of understanding into why we're doing this and and then the how behind it you know, you've got to take somebody on that entire journey. Right. I mean, I think you brought up a, a fantastic point because just during our 30 minute conversation so far, you already mentioned a bunch of partners, right? Like whether that's yeah. internal, the SD1 team mm -hmm. or external like Postman, Ansible. And so if you, you know, let's, let's shift gear a little bit. And mm -hmm. so you could put on your, you know, DevNet uh, developer mm -hmm. advocate hat. Um, cool. So besides being a producer of content you're also in charge or you know you're part of a team that's in charge of building a community whether that's mm -hmm. between your technical partners or yeah. between the the learners so yeah. what are some of the challenges that you face when you try to engage you know let's 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 break it down into when you're trying to engage partners and when mm -hmm. you try to engage you know learners to to use these great tools that we talked about it's um you know, there's a balance as well with building the community. You have to make sure that you're speaking with the right people as well. Um, you can't be too sort of, 
narrow with your suggestion. When I'm talking with anybody in communities, what I'm interested in is, is what they're doing. It's finding out what, what they're doing. If I think out and being interested as well where where their pain points are, what's what's going wrong, you know. It's great hearing stories of success, but I also like to hear what's going wrong because you know the world isn't always sunshines and rainbows, right? Everything, you know, <laughs> no things 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 really, really break, you know, and that's you know what I've always you know, when I've done uh, speaking events and things, I've always talked to about outages and, um, you know, times where I found it really, really difficult to overcome, you know, production challenges or things. And I like speaking with people in the community about that. I like finding those those pain points. I like taking those back to the BU. I like taking those back to the engineering teams as well, because, you know, we are the voice of the community. We, we take this information back from community and we, you know, liaise with the BU to say, you know, customers doing this with an you know particular api uh, and this is a, a, a potential problem you know is, is what's the solution what's the solution to this are they right. going out of, out of scope with the api does this mean that our documentation is poss possibly suggesting that the api does something that it shouldn't do or do we need to give more information to say what it should do for example a, a date range or something like that to a, a, an api call if you're you know, wanting to pull you know, historical data um, from an API or something. How does that date range look? What are the gap interval timing intervals can look like? How often can you run this API? What does it look like? Um, and then should we, you know, should we update the the the, the documentation? Um, so list for me is in in the in the community listening is is the most important thing. Is I see as well listening to what the community wants as well it's you know what would you like to see on that right have, have we, is, is there something that you know we're missing would you like us to what, what content would you like to see on there as well can we can we get that gap plugged as well and you, you know do we is a, a an area we're not covering that and that might be everything from a technology to a use case to integration with different tools you know where people are looking to do a lot like say um full stack observability right or you know CICD pipelines certain tooling that's included and listen to that feedback as well to to then think about how you know what we're going to build into the future as well so listening to the pain points thinking listening to what they want for the future as well the direction that they they see their own industry going into as well because you know the engineers are you know out, out there they're the ones chipping away at the problems. They're the ones experiencing the things within, you know, within day to day. And I want to make sure that, you know, that we're providing all of the resources that they need for them to be successful. You know, whether that's successful in the day job, whether that's successful for their career plans, I want them to have that success. Whether it's success for them get, just getting started, we want them to have that success. We've got to be able to provide that. Right, right. No, I like that. So if I unpack that a little bit, you yeah. talked about listening to the pain points of the community uh -huh. and then you becoming a bridge to uh, yeah. kind of take those concerns or take those requests. If I were to ask for a pony, like that kind of things, mm -hmm. and then you, you actually yeah. deliver a pony <laughs> yeah. to the, yeah. to the customer many times. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so I guess empathy is one of the things that you, you try to practice. Yeah. And... It is. Yeah. Empathy is one of those, those things that I really try to practice and, you know, I didn't, for many years, I was always told that empathy wasn't a strength, that I shouldn't have empathy in certain situations. And then um, it was a former mentor of mine introduced me. It was, well, was it DevNet Create actually? To, she introduced me to, to, some, some, to some people, a customer. And she said to me, she actually introduced me and said, you know, Stuart's one of the most kindest people that i know he will do anything for anybody who will help anybody you know he has a huge amount of empathy for you know people in the community and we spoke about this uh, we spoke about it in quite a quite a great quite a great detail and then i realized that empathy was my superpower mm. and it, it took me so long to learn that i was like 43 44 before I, before I learned that, but when when I realized that was my superpower, one of my superpowers, should I say, you know, my other power is the beard. 
Um, <laughs> right. Be besides the beer, besides you know, the your beer. other superpower. Yeah, my answer. And you know what? But I can I can carry two things at once. Not many <laughs> people know that. That's pretty pretty good. Um, once I started working on that and ex exploring exploring that more, I just I thought, yeah, this is this is me. This is who I am. And I, I denied that to myself for quite a while. The empathy was one of my one of my one of my superpowers. I really had. Yeah, I mean, I think internet is full of this. Um, I don't know. Should I say like macho, like hustle, and just you want yep. to? If you face mm -hmm. a wall, you're just gonna bang on it until until yeah. you know either die or you break that barrier mm -hmm. or whatnot, yeah. right? But but I think there's also another side, and as we, you and I, kind of in the same same age range, and so mm -hmm. as we grow older, you know, we realize that that might not be the best path, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so I I have to admit I was form you know squarely in that that camp before where I just need to try hard and I don't care yeah. about you know myself, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, but but you know it's great to hear you talk about empathy being your superpower and your uh, former mentor, <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about, but yeah, you're mm -hmm. your former mentor who yeah. you know help you discover that part, yeah. and of course that fits right in into your role as being a uh, developer advocate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does, and I think you know, I think you know, I've tried to I've tried to un unpack where this 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 came from as yeah. well. And I think back to when you know back in the day when I was you know back in the day when I was a hairdresser. People have come and talked to me because in many ways a hairdresser barber is, is a confident. You know, people come along and they, you know, you, you know, my, you know, my, uh, I was chatting with my, you know, my wife and stuff. And, you know, we was talking about something and, you know, I had this a bit of a problem. And my, my wife, my wife says to me, you know, you should, you know, really go and talk to, talk to a professional about something else. Like, you know, yeah, we don't, you know. Yeah, we, we don't really do this. We go to barbershops to talk about our problems. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Which I think nice. is, you know, it's really funny. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't obviously go there myself. Um, <laughs> you you <laughs> can have that at, at your at your living room or something. Yeah, exactly. But this is, you know, it comes from, and you, you know, you talk to people and technology is, technology is only one part of my job. As yeah. an advocate, technology is one part of my job. You know, right. it's like you were saying about the community and the people as well that's to, to me the community and the people and and that the, they're just and the technology is just one it's just one thing and you can't have one without the other right um, but yeah it's um listening to people and understanding and you know this is again it comes back from days of years of customer service is put yourself in that customer position right because at some point you know at some point you or I are always the customer. So that doesn't, you know, that we can go into a retail store, we can go into a coffee place, we could, you know, we could be talking to our ISP. At some point, we are the customer. Everybody is always, you know, I like to think about it. It's, all of us are the shopkeeper and all of us are the customer. And we play different roles. And sometimes we're the shopkeeper and sometimes we're, you know, the customer. You know, I don't like going, I don't like, you know, going, being a customer and, getting no information from a you know from from whatever service it is that i'm paying for or i don't like getting the you know having bad support nobody likes that nobody likes bad service mm -hmm. and so i put myself all the time i put myself into that customer's position right you know that that person asking for help i put myself into their position and think wow if i was dealing with this how would i feel right you know I, would i feel as frustrated as they are yes i would in yeah. fact, I would, I would, I, I, I admire them now because, you know, they're they're explaining this in a cool, calm manner. I would be losing it. <laughs> <laughs> What's me? You know, you know, two months into this, and I'm still dealing with this problem. I would be yelling from the rooftops at this stage. You know, so kudos to them for keeping it really level and calm. Right. But yeah, but it, they're. Yeah, there. I think so. You know, so I worked in the attack before. So I was a tier yeah. three support as yeah. well. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I was young, and I could totally relate to what you were talking about. Yeah. It's like sometimes I feel like just going to my psychiatrist's office is just lay mm -hmm. down for a few hours and yeah. just to work off that issue, to work mm -hmm. off that steam. But yeah. but you're right. You know, it's it's definitely one of the superpowers that people could have is to have more empathy, is to put yourself in other people's shoes. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. And funny yeah. that you mentioned your your hair, you know, your barber <laughs> shop experience yeah. because there there are definitely movies that's been made, right? And there's actually a show on Netflix by LeBron James and his gang mm. for um, and I th- I think it's multiple seasons too. Like they just start chatting about you yeah. know serious issues, but it's in mm. a relaxed environment because yeah. they were in a barber shop that yeah. um you know his his yeah. uh, agent and he invites mm-hmm. all these famous friends to talk about mm. uh, you know race issues and all that so so it's definitely interesting that yeah. that you brought that up yeah and that's yeah. what we do you know we've had that those conversations when we're you know when we've had in-person events you know and we had let's just go live and you know you get people come up to you and they want to talk to you about all of these you know the things and sometimes you know they just they just want to tell they want to talk to somebody about you know the cool things that they're doing right and it's you know and then they want to show you and it's just brilliant to be able to see that as well you know i think that's one of the other you know the another great thing to this job is seeing all the cool things that everybody's doing you know in the industry and sometimes it's just mind-blowing you yeah know, to see what you know what everybody's doing but yeah to talk about all of these things and to talk about the you know all of these you know the problems and the frustrations and things and it, besides the technology it goes into problems and frustrations with you know sometimes the way that um uh, companies are dealing with issues yeah you know how how someone is, is frustrated in their job because they want to do some things a certain way and they know this is a great idea but they're trying to sell that idea to their team lead to their manager to you know, to somebody to to make this adoption, you know, to go down this, you know, uh, you know, like a DevOps or net DevOps path, become more agile and things, and they're getting all of this resistance. And they want even advice on, you know, well, how do I make that, how do I make that change within my team? How do I lead up the chain and you know show the organization that I've that I, us as a team are capable of delivering this, you know, next generation of service. So there's, you know, you know, besides the pain points in the technology, there's also the business side as well. Yeah. You know, it's funny how how often, like you said, technology is only one part. The yeah. most difficult part is your layer A, layer nine, is yeah. to build that trust and um and you know, build that capability in mm. communicating and yeah. in so those are the meta skills, right? Like so technology will be a hard skill, yes. but your soft yeah. skill will be your communication, your writing, yeah. how do you yeah. convince people? Yeah, yeah. And I made loads of mistakes in the early days. I remember the first Oh, I you and I in, both. <laughs> I, I worked in uh, I worked in local government for a period and this the company that I worked for was contracted to look after, you know, where we live in in, in England in Lincolnshire. Right. And uh you know, so I worked for this company who are managing all of the services. So that was everything to do with government, so fire and schools and libraries, and municipal services you know that that entire network campus which you know spread massively across lincolnshire that was all run by this company right and the company that i would worked at before you know a, a change rfc was or a change was just shouting out to somebody else in the room to say hey i'm making this change and we just made changes in prod you know straight away <laughs> it wasn't, thankfully it wasn't particular it wasn't it wasn't the most sort of you know technical thing but if you weren't competent enough, you were going to cause outages, but you would say out loud, I'm making a change here. And that was the change control. It really was. Then yeah. you made the change back the system up and stored it on a FTP server. Simple, you know, just taking a change to a router, scraping the config, saving it, put it in the FTP, done. Easy peasy. This one, um, you know, I went straight into like a full cab having to write a, a full RFC right and after like three or four attempts of writing the rfc um it got approved and i had to take it to the cab on a thursday morning and so i went into this cab and there's 12 people sat around the table and it was kind of like waiting at a doctor's surgery you were sat outside (laughs) engineers and then your you know your manager who was in this meeting with the cab yeah kind of like beckoned you in and you went in and there's like 12 15 people sat around this big table your manager said, oh, you know, this is a, you know, introduce you. He said, and he's looking to make a change. And this is under RFC. They gave the number. You were allocated the number. And then you had to explain why. Well, me being absolutely naive in this situation, went in there and decided to show everybody how technically superior I was. <laughs> how, much, how much knowledge, and I was told five minutes, how much could I cram into five minutes? 
And I, I went up there, and I mean, it was like I had verbal diarrhea. I, I mean, I explained this thing in the most minutest detail, trying to show people just how clever I was, right. how much I knew about this situation. I finished my five minute speech, expecting everybody to stand up around the table and start, you know, yeah, giving me they the, start the kissing your of, ring, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Stand up. Oh, this is brilliant. You know, like I've just invented fire um, <laughs> or discovered fire, should I say. Um, and they all sat there with this, like, just looking at me, you know, and my manager actually stood up and he just said, okay, um, we, we won't put this change due to this cab. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll reevaluate it and we'll have Stuart present at next week's cab. <laughs> and I was like, came out of there and I, I, I said to him, I said, Whoa, what was wrong like this? And he said, you understand everybody sat around that table there, didn't understand a word you said. And, right. he said, and he said, look, this is the, he said, I'm sorry, I should have ex probably explained this to you. This is the audience. They just want to know why you're making the change at a high level, what impact it will have on the business and the outcomes for right. this. Right. And if something goes wrong, what's the rollback? What's the potential? It's like, okay. They went back into the cab next week. I actually ran it by my manager and said, this is what I'm planning to say. He's right. like, perfect, went into there. And I mean, I went in there and just said, I'm going to log into this switch. I'm going to change the duplex on this port. And I'm going to also add a VLAN on this trunk. And I explained why I was right. just doing that. Short, simple. It was under a minute. You know, we're putting this new service on there. Everybody nodding around the table. Anybody disagree? I got a thumbs up from everybody around the table. And I just walked <laughs> straight out there. In, nice. You know, that's, you know, but that's that business part. Yeah. It's the business part. And there's been so many times when, in my career, I've gone into these meetings and I have just gone in with the wrong information. Wrong inf Let me rephrase that. I've gone in with the information that is wrong for the audience, the people who, you know, want to know. And that's a, that's a skill within itself is right. being able to communicate to different levels, diff you know, different levels, different engineers, different managers, uh, different directors, you know, different people within within an organization as well yeah. is having that different conversation you have to change a lot of your wording around and i'm still learning this i really really am still learning this this is still i still it's a long process for me a long process yeah but you know that goes right back into your role as a developer advocate you're talking to mm. different communities especially you know some people are business focused some people are technology focused but you have to be able to speak the language of yes. these these different parts yeah. And um, you you brought up a, a good point about cab and all that. So mm. it kind of reminds me of um, how we all how this whole process started, right? This book called The Phoenix Project. Oh, I so love we'll, that book. yeah, yeah, we'll put the we'll put the show notes in. But you know, um, I think it's Gene Kim who wrote. You know, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll verify that. But um, yeah, so he wrote that book and he talked about like it was very entertaining to read. Um, yeah. Well, and yeah. um I, I take it that you're a big fan as well but yeah 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 but it, yeah. and then he went on to to uh start all these devops conferences and yeah. and here we are right talking about devops mm -hmm. or network yeah. engineering and so um i highly um highly suggest highly recommend yeah. people to give it a give it a, a read mm -hmm. i mean it's very entertaining it's right it as in a, a fictional but also mm -hmm. techno technically yeah. accurate matter yeah, it is and it really is i i think the thing that he does the best in that book is that he is able to represent the characters in the book and you can really identify with both excuse me you can identify with the the scenarios and the characters so much in that book you can go <laughs> I, I used to work with someone who was just like that yeah, you know, or yeah. I, I am working with somebody who's just like that and then you read something you read about like I mean, I identify this, and if you haven't read the book, there's a character in that called Brent, and I identify with being being Brent, yeah. being being that being that person who just seems to be involved in everything, and I've right, been in that right. situation in in certain you know certain companies, and and I'm I, I am the blocker, I am the pain point because I've just got too much to do, right. and this isn't because you know, the team or the other people on the team aren't capable of doing the job. It's just everything just seems to flow in this direction, you know, and I will turn around and just go, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. I'll, I'll help you. Yeah. You know? 
So saying yes, again, another another skill here is, you know, on one, it's I, you know, I, I, I preach more than I practice. I really admit that. Saying no. No, I can't do that right now. Saying no. Wow, that is hard. I mean, it's and, and and when you start saying it, especially when you start saying it to people who are normally hearing yes a lot from you, when you start yeah. saying no to them, yeah, we talked about this in the book as well. Yeah, when you start saying no, that's a shot. It's difficult. It really is. But and I think and I read a saying on this recently, and I, I'm going to get the quote completely wrong, and it was something like a a heartfelt no is better than a a midway yes or something mm. like that right you know, i get that where, yeah so i think yeah that is actually just saying to someone no I, I can't do that i can't do that for you i can't do that for you right now i yeah. can do it for you but this is when this is going to be right you know? and this these these are my these are my timelines here <laughs> because of you know other things otherwise we're just piled up to like you know here with <laughs> with constant flowing work right so just to give people some context of that, if you haven't read the book, you know, mm -hmm. so Brenda is this person who is a linchpin. He's involved mm -hmm. in every single process yeah. and he's so knowledgeable because his aptitude for learning and yeah. uh, as uh, because of that, he developed all these skill sets that are uniquely mm -hmm. fitting in every single situation. Therefore, he yeah. becomes the bottleneck. And yeah. as what Stu was saying, um, you know, just become the bottleneck and he he's involved in every single process and therefore mm -hmm. uh, people were, were you know kind of the clog up against that but yeah you know they they do offer a solution one of which is what Stu mentioned about you know saying no start saying no mm. and um also automation right like you you yeah. automate something the the boring yeah. stuff the mundane task so it eliminates uh mistakes eliminates human mm. error factors and you will free up you know the mm. the stews yeah. and the brand of the world for mm. more time to do interesting stuff so yeah. We we mentioned DevNet Create a few times in our conversation, mm. and DevNet Create was when I actually met you, right? Like we actually met yeah. in person before yeah. COVID, and yeah. and uh, it was a great experience. So yeah. you know, obviously because of the times, you know, we the this turned into virtual last year, and I believe this year is going to be virtual as well. So virtual. so um, if you listen to this this podcast or watch this video before the nineteenth, it's uh, happening this year on twenty yeah. uh, twenty twenty one is. October 19th, and it's going to be two days. It's going to be three time zones mm -hmm. um, yeah. accommodating uh, people's schedule that way. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the benefit of being virtual. But I, I need to stop talking and let the expert mm -hmm. speak. So Stu, tell us a little bit about DevNet Create. Yeah, so DevNet Create, this is our fifth DevNet Create. So it's like, this is the fifth year. Um, and I mean, each year, each year DevNet Create gets better and better. And really DevNet Create is that chance for the community customers, partners to come and demo and show in you know, a variety of different ways, workshops, lightning talks, tutorials, um, to be able to come and show what they're working on. You right. know, there might just be, this might be just something that they've, you know, they're squirreling away at, you know, in their basement and they've built, you know, something really, really cool. And this this project, um, or it might be something that they're doing in 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 with their teams, you know, and they've had a whole team working on this, and um, it's a workflow. But it's not just network automation; it's not just using APIs. There's a lot of software in here as well, right. a lot of cloud as well. Plus, we have a lot of talks around around process as well. You know, well, as you mentioned in the CAD change and things about um, how to you know talking about you know, business strategies and things like that we have some super speakers talking about that we're going to talk about devnet certifications obviously you know there's big announcement coming there you made yesterday for the devnet expert is is now is now being launched and oh you just said it but okay <laughs> no it is public <laughs> it is public yeah it is it is public now yeah it was it was announced yesterday um from learning at cisco but there's a lot more a lot more content to be um um a lot more things to be shared as well you know, at DevNet Create around the DevNet Expert. So we really capture a lot of, you know, a lot of great, you know, cutting edge industry focused tools as well. And we have a huge lineup of, of really, really great guest speakers, both from internally at Cisco, you know, Todd Nightingale's there. And we've got um, CTO from Hashi there this year as well. Um, speaking as well, uh, you know, past events, we had Guy Kawasaki speaking at, um, at the event. You know, we do have, 
so many different people coming from lots of re- different backgrounds, different industries, different tech as well. And that's what we look for every year. You know, the CFP comes in and then we, you know, we divide and conquer the CFP between, you know, the advocates. And we start reading about the sessions and then looking through, um, you know, the sessions to, to start looking about, you know, which one, uh, you know, we're going to have, uh, who's going to be presenting. Some of the people are first time speakers and some of them are, you know, uh, expert speakers like yourself, Eric, who've been, you know, speaking about that. So it's really, if you've got something cool to show and, you know, whether you've been working on it, your team's been working on it, creates a really, really great place to do that. A really, really great place to do it. Well, since you mentioned it, I'll, I'll do a little personal plug. So um, on, thank you for mentioning it. And you're a speaker as well. So congrats. Uh, but I'll, I'll be speaking on the second day on uh, about Kafka, which is something I find really mm. cool. And uh, it's about data streaming. So if you were to kind of summarize what Kafka is, there's really, you know, data in motion, set data in motion. And it's mm-hmm. allowing data to, you know, it's not just an API, not just in the database, but kind of morph into this live living thing that for you to use. But uh, tell us what you'll be speaking on, Stu. I uh, Yes, I've got, a co- I've got a couple of sessions. Um, oh, wow. Year. Yeah, um, so I'm going to be hosting the EMEA section. So mm-hmm. as you were mentioning, it's across different time zones. So I'm co-hosting that with uh, Julio Gomez, who okay. is a um, programmability architect. He's based in, in Spain. So Julio, again, is my co-host. The, uh, he was my co-host last year. Um, so we're going to be, you know, introducing, you know, uh, all of the all of the sessions throughout um, throughout that throughout that time zone as well. Um, a couple of sessions that I am involved in, I've got a, um, a, a talk and a demo with um, a Brandon from Tab9. Okay. So we're doing, we're doing a whole bunch of work with, um, with Tab9, and I do a demo with, with Tab9 as well. So that's a really good uh, one to, to tune into. The other piece that I've done uh, a demo or I've, I'm talking with is, 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 is the DevNet expert as well. So I'm, I'm on a couple of panels for you know, the DevNet expert as well. So we're talking about that too. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So it, as if we need more motivation to to sign up for DevNet, obviously, um, not obviously, but, you know, it's kudos to Cisco for making it free. So it is free to register. Mm-hmm. If you haven't registered, uh, go for it. But, you know, if you listen to this after the event, of course, all the uh, just like last previous year, I'll get a confirmation mm-hmm. from you. But you know, like everything's recorded that people can yep. watch later on, right? Yeah, everything's recorded for catch up. Yeah, and and I think that's great as well because it gives you a chance to go back and rewatch some sessions as well if you're looking for links or content. You know, or you just want to refresh on some of those, or because we've we've got three channels as well which are running throughout the day. Yeah. Um, as well, you know, the main channel and then you know, Secure Code Warrior as well running as well throughout the day. You're able to go back and catch up on those sessions as well, um, and, and rewatch them. So it's all good. Yeah, nice, nice. So, um, what excites you? So you mentioned DevNet Create just gets better and better. This is mm-hmm. your seventh year. I think yeah. I'm personally involved with this. Will be my my third year, but okay. what? Yeah. So what is the uh, the thing that personally most excites you about this year's Create? I think again, it's 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 what the community is bringing, um, mm. and and uh, you know to see, I, I'm very 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 privileged to be involved in the CFP process. You know, as 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 submissions come in, you know, after the CFP is closed, we get to go through these and evaluate these, and you read through them, and you just think, I just can't wait to see this. <laughs> you really just can't wait to see this. You like. You know, it, it, it's tempting when you're, you know, like a CFP, you know, you're involved in the CFP or SGM, I think, session group manager, I think is the correct term. As you're, you know, reviewing these, it's tempting to reach out to that person just to say, hey, you know, could you give me a little preview of this? You know, you know <laughs> have to look behind, you know, have a preview because you just can't wait to see it. But yeah, so just, I think just, you know, what the, what the community is bringing and what the, you know, the speakers are bringing every year it just gets better and better and better you know the the what they they have this really what i find is they have this real entrepreneurship of building something right you know to to do this and 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 some you know 
sometimes you know you're watching just thinking wow that's just so amazing to see that actually taking place this how this is coming together and sometimes it's not you know like you're you know you're talking about kafka and i don't i know very very little about kafka it doesn't come in it really hasn't come into my day to day so i might want to find out more you know about your session about kafka and i look at it i just think wow kafka's cool and I'm, my mind is then starting to click thinking well i could use it in this use case or i can use it over here or this is something I'd like to learn more about. So it might just start me on my journey. And the sessions that people are showing really inspire me to do that. So that, that for me is the best bit, is seeing what the community brings to create every year, year upon year. Yeah, me too. Me too. I think I think that goes for, you mentioned the entrepreneurial spirit. I would say yeah. the, the common theme I see for all the speakers, uh, yourself included, as well as many of the other distinguished speakers, is the bias for action, right? They always mm -hmm. just like, okay, I see a problem, but instead of, you know, just say, oh, that's a problem. Most most of the speakers uh, would just roll out their sleeve and go, how, what can I do to solve this problem? At mm -hmm. least make a, make a, a meaningful dent into the problem. So the next guy, even if I can't solve it, the next guy will be able to make further progress and all of yeah. that. Yeah. And they're there to share their experience. So that's what's cool yeah. about it, right? Mm -hmm. DevNet Create provides the central location for people to just come together, speak like-minded talks, and uh, solve problems together. So that's why yeah. excites me the most about it as well. Yeah, I, I think I think that really shows the community spirit of you know of, of DevNet and DevNet Create. It really does. Yeah. So you know, Stu, I, I feel like I could talk to you for for <laughs> you know forever, really, you know, because we're just so similar. We're in the same age yeah. range and our background, you know, even though we live in different parts of the Atlantic Ocean, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we gotta change that, right? Uh, I don't. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Yeah. So um, before you know, we're, we're coming up on the hour, but before we say goodbye, um, I see your Twitter handle on the mm -hmm. um, on on your name tag. So yeah. where be, you know where can people find you find you on the social media on the web and so on? Yeah, this is the best place to find me. I'm very active on Twitter, like you are. Um, Twitter is the best place to connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn as well, just under Stuart Clark, and you'll be able to find me. Uh, you know, connect. I'm in the Cisco DevNet um, yeah. organization. Um, so I'm on I'm on LinkedIn as well, but yeah, Twitter's the, Twitter's generally the best place to find me. We run a number of um, uh, DevNet program and DevNet support um, uh, teams rooms as well. So I'm often found in there as well, helping the community out or helping people out who've got questions around um, Cisco technologies or coding or something. And then there's the um, uh, Cisco Learning Network. I'm also quite active in that one as well. Right. Um, anything that falls under, you know, DevNet's remit or anything to do with APIs, which, you know, the things that I advocate for, um, I'm usually contributing in those rooms as well. I, I block my time out in the morning. I'd sort of like do maybe 30 minutes to an hour just going through all of those, you know, different chat spaces and things, you know, seeing if I can help anybody out or, you know, point them in the right direction towards resources or something like that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, but if you search, you know, you mentioned Twitter is the best place to reach yeah. you, but if you search Stuart Clark, you will be disappointed or reach somebody else. His <laughs> Stuart's Twitter handle is actually Big Evo Beer. So B I G E V I O B A R D. Yeah. Um, of course, we'll have it in the show notes, but, you know, uh, being a true, you know, empathetic leader as he is, he's always hanging out on, you know, yeah. uh, web, uh, you know, Cisco spaces from everywhere, from mm -hmm. DevNet to, uh, maybe Slack channels or something else yeah. that will help help people out. So, last but not least, any call to action? I, I think I, I could guess what your call to action is, but um, <laughs> I, I want to hear from your mouth and any call to action to our listeners before before we go. Yeah, I'd love to see you all at DevNet Create. DevNet Create is uh, it, it's going to be great this year. We, there's so many, so many, so many great speakers. Um, so we'd love to see you there. Love to see feedback as well um if you're writing code or you've got any great code examples you'd like to share as well you can head over to um devnet code exchange always looking for submissions on code exchange um there's a again whole range of um, topics and verticals that this can fall into um for just using code examples um how you're using cisco apis because it's always great to see how people are consuming the things that you're part of the company that you're building as well How's this being used as well? So code exchange is, is, is really, really great for that. So if you've got a cool piece of code, put it into code exchange, but create 
definitely works out. We've got some great giveaways, some great swag this year, some great competitions. You might be able to win yourself a cool beanie like Eric Scott or a hoodie or a T-shirt. Yeah. You can look all, 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 uh, all fetch there like you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I will also want to mention that if you submit uh, to code, uh, code Exchange and you get a, uh, it's, you know, submitted, admitted, you actually get a pretty cool badge to, to display on, yeah. on GitHub uh repo that it's you know uh co you know uh, on code exchange yeah. and it's kind of a, a you could put that heather in your hat too yeah it is yeah we like to yeah you can get the badges as well to go on there as well which yeah it looks really cool nice so so it's been it's been a pleasure thank you for being it's on really the show my pleasure all right so Thank you for listening to the Network Automation Nerds podcast today. Uh, find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other major platforms. Until next time, bye-bye. Mm -hmm.